Hello all, this is Dr. Dave Maslach talking to you about reciprocity.com. The E is written with a three. And in this particular video, I wanna talk about how do you actually budget during graduate school? So if you don't know, I'm a professor of innovation strategy and entrepreneurship, and I created this whole reciprocity project to give back as much as I possibly can, because there are so many people that helped me in graduate school that I just wanted to extend it to, to everybody and, and op open it up to a lot of people. So I created this sort of sharing economy proofreading platform. And, um, and now I'm doing all these YouTube videos for graduate students around the world. And hopefully this is gonna be helpful for you. So I do have a PhD myself. I went through and I actually took seven years. So I, would, I finished my PhD in five years. Then I did two years of um, sort of postdoc-y kind of stuff. And I also did a master's degree before all of that stuff um, in management science. So I've been doing, I did graduate school for a long time and it was extremely tough financially and dealing with all those kind of things. So caveat, my uh, wife was working at the time. So we did have some extra resources and things like that, but it was still really tough when we were in graduate school and what the cool thing is um with with you know living off of such a small budget during graduate school and everybody will say this if they continue to sort of go on in their in their endeavors and all that stuff beyond that is you you learn how to live off this really tiny budget and then basically you're just living off that little budget going forward you don't really need a lot and which is really nice because it kind of gets you out of the whole rat race and stuff. So it, it frees up all these extra resources later on for me to do cool things like this sort of reciprocity thing. It costs a heck of a lot of money to do the software development for that. And it's all been funded by my my wife and I, it's, you know, it's privately funded and all that kind of stuff. We're sort of giving as much as we possibly can into that particular project to help out people. Um, and it's, you know, it's more myself, I guess, that I'm sort of pushing this for, but my wife is being, um, and she's being just so gracious and wonderful with dealing, um, allowing me to do this kind of stuff. Cause I know it's crazy. So, um, how do you actually budget with a, within graduate school? So first of all, there is a tremendous amount of benefit from, from learning how to do this. Uh, we did this, my wife and I did this uh, through graduate school off and on. I mean, budgeting is one of those things that you do it and you know it's it's like everything in life right it's like going on a you know making sure that you're eating healthy and stuff like that it works for three or four months and then you kind of fall off the bandwagon and then you got to go back on it and you constantly are doing that it's like anything in life right exercising the exact same thing and so don't feel bad if you it, you know if you don't budget a month or something like that just go back and do it again right like this is a lifelong thing and you're going to have to learn how to do this going forward right and so if you're like me we were learning how to do life at the same time as i was in graduate school and thankfully those lessons actually did work going forward and it stuck with us in terms of doing these so i personally had a excel spreadsheet i did all the you know um how much money we were going to basically with a with a budget what you have to think about is you you want to tally up how much you're going to make for and it's actually really easy we we do this on a piece of paper now it's sort of simplifying our life and we just do it on a monthly basis um and all you have to do is go through and tally up how much you're going to make for the month and then you tally up how much you're going to spend for the month just go through all the different stuff it should take you I don't know, uh, half an hour. And then after that, you have a discussion of anything else that you would like to get. And if there's extra resources available, then you can do all that kind of stuff. So now that I'm a, a professor, it's, it's, it's easy because there is extra resources available. We can do some really fun things. But when you're in graduate school, if you were like me, you're really just making enough that you are just kind of surviving and getting along. And most graduate students, and this is what I'm thinking about when I was creating this whole reciprocity project, is they could people can really use something like this, um, is that most uh, graduate students are, are living actually below the poverty line. If you look at that, in most countries, they're living well below the poverty line and they're barely scraping by. And some countries, it's, it's really kind of a strange phenomenon, to be honest, if you think about it, because you're doing this graduate degree and um, you're, you're supposed to be making enough to, to survive, but then they have like weird tax laws and stuff like that that sort of penalize you sometimes. So being a graduate student, 
Um, and so it's actually a little bit harder sometimes to, to um, get by on, on uh, um, you know, the, the graduate, because you're, you're being employed, right? But then you can't get, um, but you're also sort of classified under, you know, educational kind of thing, but then you're, you're getting employed. And so you miss out on some of the benefits of not being, uh, you know, employed, but you're really, you know, it's kind of in this kind of weird zone where you're kind of neither working or not really, you know, in school, like undergraduate school, right, where you can get through and get it done and, and all that kind of stuff. So you're in this kind of weird zone um, and you're doing that for a long, long time, an extremely long time, um, you know, and the the other thing that 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 is really strange is a lot of graduate students, including myself, just don't really, we don't really have a good idea of how long it actually is going to take something to do. And uh, you kind of underestimate how long it's going to be, right? So you might plan. So so for myself, I thought it was going to, I was, and I was really, you know, I'm not bragging in any sort of way, but, you know, I was kind of studious, let's just say that kind of nerdy. And, uh, you know, I thought I was going to get through in four years, my master's, I was able to turn a two-year program into a year program and got through. And so I thought, ah, you know, I, like I can do this four-year program in four years, no problem. Then I get get into it and I realize that, um, you know, that you have to publish papers and all that kind of stuff and do all this tremendous amount of work, which is great. And, um, you know, that, that, that I'm not complaining in any sort of way, but I just kind of underestimated how long it's actually going to take. And, and the demands is not the program itself, what limits how long you, how long it's going to take you or what sort of stretches out how long it's going to take you. But it's the fact of what the market is, is telling, right? So um, it just takes a long time to write papers and to get them through, particularly in my field and in, in um, strategy, it just takes a long time. Or I know like econ is the same thing. Um, economics, it takes a long time. Or sociology, it just takes a long time to get papers published and through the process. And that's just kind of what goes on, right? So in some fields, you can get a lot of papers published. But still, even if you're getting a lot of papers published, you have to compete with other people that are getting all the more papers published. And so it's taking, it'll still take you just as long to get done. You know, you might be able to get a PhD in three years and race through it, but that doesn't mean you're actually going to get an academic job or get out. So a lot of people will just take a lot, um, you know, longer in their program. And it's not really, we're, you're not certain on how long it's going to be. You know when it's done, when it's done, right? You're not really clear on what it's going to be. And you can end um, your PhD research at any sort of time and sort of wrap it up at any sort of time. It doesn't take that long to do that but you have to do it so it's good enough for the marketplace if you're going to play the academic game going forward. Um, and I think one of the reasons why students, graduate students actually stop with their PhD program or don't really continue on and kind of get burnt out or whatnot, it's just because of the financial demands, right? They just get tired of living like a student and it's hard, right? Living off of, um, you know, noodles and things like that, which a lot of us do. Mind you, you know, I, I love to cook and stuff like that. So we always had pretty good meals. Um, you know, my wife and I would always cook and we, we would always have pretty good meals no matter what. We can live pretty cheaply on some ground beef um, and, and you, can, you can do pretty well with, with the ground beef and some vegetables and stuff like that. So, but yeah, like um, there is definitely things to think about with that. And, and with the financial concerns, it, you just don't, you know, a lot of PhD or a lot of graduate students will stop simply because of that, the demands and the stress that that creates on, on yourself and a family going forward. And the other thing that you should, I should really, really point out is that if you're betting on funding sources like scholarships and bursaries and grants like that, that is probably the wrong thing to do. You're, the chances of getting those things are so small. Now, um, I was fortunate enough to get scholarships and stuff like that to fund it, but then what happened was that my institution, so here's the crazy thing is, in, and this happened, this is totally common in a lot of institutions, is that they will, if you get external funding, they will sort of take the funding that you're getting and from their institution, give it to somebody else, which is fine. Um, you know, but it's just one of those things that you have to be well aware of that, you know, the funding, external funding sources doesn't necessarily mean that you do get 
funding and extra funding and stuff like that. Now, sometimes you do, and some people are really extremely fortunate, and this video is not for you, if that's the case. And this will be for you. It's very helpful. Um, but at the same time, it's not for you because there's lots of people that are dealing with um, a lot more, you know, it's just tougher if you don't really know what's going to happen going forward. Um, so what I would do is, uh, again, I would recommend doing sort of a monthly budget on a regular basis. You could do it on an Excel spreadsheet because then you can sort of keep track of things every month and you can see whether you're making progress and stuff like that. Um, I, I do use Mint on a regular basis. So if you haven't checked that out, Mint is an app. It, I, it, was, it was a startup a few years ago, I think in 2010, they created a cool, cool app and it's free. And now Intuit owns it and you can do um, budgeting on there. It's not nearly as good as just using a piece of paper that you could also use. Um, Dave Ramsey has every dollar and I haven't used it. And the only thing is you have to pay $100 a year, roughly $100 a year to use it, to sync it with your banks. And uh, Mint does the exact same thing for free. Uh, and so, but they have kind of different styles, right? So every dollar is forward facing and what we would call forward facing. So you're planning for the future and mint is kind of backwards facing. So you get transactions and then you put it into your budgets and, and things like that and classify it after that, which both of them, both of them are, are useful. I, I personally prefer mint um, at, just because I've always used it. And now all, that's, all my information is there and, and I track it. So what I use mint for is sort of tracking how long or what's happening with our finances, right? And so it's really cool over, and, and it's not like the immediate month and stuff like that. You don't see anything like that. But over the course of years, you start seeing this kind of thing, right? And you could start seeing, oh yeah, I mean, I'd start, you, you start seeing things climb and, and um, things are getting financially better and all that kind of stuff. So it's really fun to see that. And it's exciting to see that over the course of, um, of your lifetime, right? And so that that's the value with having a program like that. Now you could do the exact same thing in Excel. It's just going to take you a lot of grunt work to do that. It's going to be lots of work. Um, or you can do so on a, a monthly budget, just use a piece of paper. It's going to be the easiest thing going forward. And um, it really what it is, is uh, using, using it as kind of like a contract for yourself. And as well, if you have a partner, so, so I had my wife um, and, you know, you can, if you have a partner that's, that's there, you want to sort of communicate what you're going to do and you can use it as a communication tool. And that's really all it, all the budget is every single month. And it's going to help you sort of go forward. And, you know, there's, there's some things you're going to underestimate how much you spend on food. You're going to spend a lot on food. Um, that's going to be the, probably the biggest thing. And some of the other stuff you can't really change too much. And so it's like utilities that it is what it is. And you can sort of change things um, here and there. You can maybe cut out air conditioning if you live in a place where that's doable. I live in Florida. It's not doable. Um, you can, it, well, you can, but um, our our family life is not going to survive. I'll tell you that. So, but um you know, like there's things like that that you can sort of cut out. And you know what? We all lived years ago, 50 to 100 years ago. We all lived without any of this kind of stuff. So if you have to cut it out, cut it out, right? Like it's not a big deal. If you have to move to something smaller, then it's not a big deal. You have to move to something smaller and live in a just tinier apartment, right? Um, you know, if there's four of you, if you have a couple of kids and, and you have to live in a small apartment, well, I, that's what you have to do. And you just do that for a little bit to get that done. And, and don't worry about it, right? Like nobody cares. Um, you know, nobody externally cares. I'll tell you that. The only people that are going to care is your family. But at the same time, you can get through this. It's not a big deal uh, to get through this kind of stuff, right? Like yeah, at the end of the day, it's really not a big deal. So um, what I, I would also do with sort of financial planning and thinking about budgeting and things like that, I would read a personal finance book. So there's lots of different books that are available. That So my wife and I, when we started out, um, we got married. And uh, one of the best presents that I personally got was from my sister for our wedding. And she gave us a financial planning book. And that was amazing. She was awesome to do that and kind of brave because we, but, you know, we're kind of nerdy. So that was okay. Um, um, you know, but it could have been interpreted the wrong way. I'll tell you that. But, but anyways, yeah, no, it was really wonderful for her to do that. And it got our marriage off to a great start. And so we read that what we would do is we would sit down and read that every night. So I would read a chapter, she would read a chapter and we'd read it out loud, totally nerdy, 
totally nerdy. And I remember, I still have fun memories of doing that. It was really fun. Um, that was like the only book that we've done that with since then. And that was probably a long time ago. But anyways, um, things that would not happen now, I'll tell you that. So, but, but back then it was great. And, and if you could do that, that's, that's wonderful to read it out loud. We just do it on our bed and um, read the book out loud, right? And, and just that when we're going to sleep, we read it out loud and then we'd sort of say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And then we'd sort of implement that over the course of, you know, a matter of, of you know, the next month and, and stuff like that, how to do this. So the one that I would, the books that, that are decent um, are Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it's, it's okay. Um, the Wealthy Barber is really good. It's by a Canadian author. So I'm Canadian originally. So check it out. And I can't remember the guy's name. The Wealthy Barber is great. It's actually a really, really good book. Um, but the stuff that I would recommend that I personally would recommend, and I do that on a regular basis, and I tell other people, and I'm a big advocate of this guy is Dave Ramsey stuff, simply because he is using sort of more behavioral finance techniques. And um, he calls it sort of based on religion and things like that. But, you know, you don't have to pay attention to that so much. Just know that a lot of it is really sound from a behavioral finance perspective. So how we actually behave rather than what we actually do or what we should do, but what we actually do. And there is a huge change that's happening in finance right now in economics about behavioral economics and behavioral finance. And it's really looking at how we actually do things. And, and Dave Ramsey's on point. He is doing an amazing job. Highly, highly recommend his stuff. Uh, go through one of my colleagues had uh, recommended that um, and and finally he went through financial peace university and and he's doing really well with that um, and uh, yeah so so anyways the financial peace university is a great little program I think you can get it online as well if you want and and it's not only just a book but then you actually go through and actually take coursework and stuff like that highly highly recommend it um, very cool stuff uh, going forward and. Okay, so when you're in graduate school, make sure that, oh, and the reason why you wanna do that and make sure that if you have a spouse, you're both doing it at the exact same time because that helps you um, both get on the same track, right? So if one of, if you're getting this information and the other person's not getting the information, it doesn't help you at all. So for us, that was really good for us is just being on the same page because you know i went through when i did a phd in business administration i know a lot of that kind of stuff and so i was thinking like this and then my wife was thinking over here and what reading the book together got us to think together and we we were definitely a lot more linked in in thinking it um a lot more in lines uh and it was very useful honestly it was very very useful for our family or it was it was great so um it's second thing when you're in graduate school don't be investing in anything don't invest in like bitcoin or you know even just regular your 401k or what um canada's rsps whatever it is you know around the world just don't invest in in anything at this moment your goal is just to make sure that you're not going into any more debt than what you currently are and just keep going forward right so any of that money just just make sure that you're just at zero and that's a big thing that's a difference between and that's why i'm doing this video is it's really different when you're in graduate school because compared to what all these financial gurus tell you about um because these financial gurus are not considering the graduate student and their experience right so you are wanting to invest and you know if you're anything like me it was really ra rational well, there goes my voice yay um so if you're anything like me, it's really rational. I wanted to get all this stuff done and get going with, um, you know, financial planning and stuff like that. But you can't when you're in graduate school. You just have to hold back. And hopefully you've chosen a graduate program. You can look at some of my older videos where I talk about this kind of stuff where it's important to choose which graduate program you go into. Um, you've chosen a great graduate program that will actually get you a job in the future and, and think about the sort of um, returns that you're going to get in that program. If you didn't, it's going to be a lot more tougher. But I do know of, of people around me that went into graduate programs that I wouldn't consider as like, you know, the best choices. But at the same time, they turned out it turned out OK because they ended up getting a job uh, in completely different area. 
but and, you know, in, in completely different areas. But at the same time, they um, they were able to use this graduate program to understand like things about research design and things like that that helped them out. But completely different, non-related area, and they do pretty well by doing that. So yeah, um, but just just pick a program that's going to help you in the future and um, that's going to resolve some of these issues. So, um, and don't invest, really don't invest, even though you're going to want to, and people are talking, telling you about investing in this and that, just don't do it. Your, your goal is just to survive graduate school at this moment. Um, try not to accumulate any more student debt as much as you can. So stop it. If you, if you have any grad uh, student debt, put it on deferment or whatever it's called in your country and just stop getting any more student debt. It's going to hurt you in the long run. I guarantee it, tr just try to slow that as much as you possibly can. Um, and, you know, just just try to survive, whatever it is. So reduce your um, housing uh, that you're living at, you know, just try to survive as much as you possibly can and just get by. And, um, you know, one thing I wanted to point out with this, and the reason why I'm pointing out this is that you're going to underestimate how long it's going to take. So for me, I thought, again, I thought it was going to take four years, but it ended up taking an extra three more years beyond that <laughs> to get through the program. And then, you know, there was, there was about a year and a half uh, where there was no, just zero money coming in in any sort of way. And we had to survive off of that. So that's why I don't want you to go into any more debt because that will accumulate anyways. And you're going to try not to go into any debt and all that kind of stuff, but it's going to accumulate anyways when stuff like that happens. And, and that's really just for those moments where it's just like things, it's bad. Um, you know, when you, you're just, and it just makes life a lot worse. Let's just say that. Um, and uh, what's the other one? Oh, um, the last thing I wanted to point out with, with budgeting with graduate school is make sure that um, you are focusing on doing research and getting everything done and limiting all the responsibilities for like consulting and teaching and things like that. Um, the reason is, is because you're going to make far more money just getting that degree done than by taking any teaching and consulting gigs and stuff like that to survive at the moment. I know it's going to be really hard to do, but don't teach too much because uh, the amount of money that you're going to make from teaching at this current moment when you're in graduate school is peanuts compared to what you're going to make when you actually get done. So you're much, much far better off getting the darn degree done. Just get it done, get out there and, and, and then teach and do a good job doing that. Um, and you're going to make far more money um, just because like you're worth in the marketplace just by having a master's degree or a PhD degree. If you're pre-master's degree and you don't complete complete it, you never get that master's degree, and you're you're not you're you're worthless, right? Like I'm not saying you're worthless, but you you don't have the same value as somebody else that has the master's degree, or you know somebody that is doctor so and so is much more valuable than somebody that didn't actually get there, right? And they can't call themselves a doctor so and so, right? So then that, that's important to think about that. So just get it done really, really just get it done. Don't start teaching and getting into that kind of mindset and stuff like that. Just get it done. So doing graduate school is extremely tough, really hard to do. Um, and you have to really take budgeting seriously, really work at it and sit down with your spouse if you're with somebody else or sit down if you're just by yourself, find an, an accountability partner or somebody that you can kind of talk to about this kind of stuff and just sit down and actually do a budget together and go this, through this kind of stuff. I mean, nobody cares. Everybody knows you're broke at this moment, but it's going to help you. So if you're worried about like disclosing how much money you make, right? You're, you're, you're not making that much, right? Like it doesn't matter that much. And, and even if you do make that much money, like who cares, right? Like at the end of the day. Um, and my point is, is just do this on a regular basis and your life is going to straighten up and you're going to feel really confident with what you're doing and it's really beneficial. Um, I've seen this many times before. I saw this with myself doing a budget and, um, you know, making sure that we do this on a regular basis just changes how you feel about life and, and going forward and your life feels much more together and you can get things done. So if you like this video, give me a thumbs up and do subscribe to the YouTube channel. All right, take care and have a wonderful day.